Welcome to Inside, produced in partnership with RSU TV at Rogers State University in Oklahoma. Today we are chatting with Marcello Angelini, artistic director of the Tulsa Ballet. Marcello has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Marcello, for joining us today. A pleasure, always a pleasure. So ballet, classical ballet, and Tulsa. Talk about classical ballet in Tulsa. Well, you see, the, the, the thing is that this city has a great tradition of classical ballet because the, the company was uh, funded, founded uh, by two former dancers of ballet Reuse, Moslin Larkin and Roman Jasinski. Um, Miss Larkin, as I called her, I had the, the, the fortune and the privilege of working with her. Miss Larkin was born in Miami, Oklahoma. And so when they retired from dancing, uh, they came back home to Tulsa and they opened a school and then a company. The company is in its 63rd year of existence. 63rd year of existence. Absolutely. In a couple of years, we will be 65 years old. And Oklahoma itself, uh, you know, the, the, the five Indian ballerinas, see, Oklahoma is a, is, a, is a state that has given birth to some of the greatest uh, uh, ballerinas of the 20th century. There is a lot of tradition for dance in this state. And the arts here in Tulsa and in this state are, are just extraordinary. Talk about your, your audience and the passions that are aroused by dance here in, in Oklahoma. Uh, well, the, the, you are absolutely right about the arts in Oklahoma. The energy around the arts in this city is very unique. The kind of support we get from the community and from the donors for our ballet company is unique. I mean, the, the, you go and talk to them and you can feel that they, they love the, the arts in general and in our case, dance in particular. Audiences are fantastic. Um, we have been very lucky to experience growth, uh, massive growth during the, the past 10, 15 years, subscription, single ticket sales, and, and I'm always amazed at the reaction of the American audience toward dance. I mean, they, you can feel that uh, once you get them in there, if you're able to touch them, they're thankful. And there are other things that are going for you. You have a situation here where you can experiment and people are okay with that experimentation. They, they're willing to embrace it. You have a, co a cost structure that allows for that. I go from major metro to major metro to major metro, where the cost structures are so onerous that people have become risk adverse. And when art becomes risk adverse, when art becomes conservative, you end up finding that year over year over year you lose. Art exists at the intersection between the past, the present, and the future. Um, experimentation leads to building the path to the future. And technique is rooted in the past. It is the exploration, the physical manifestation of technique that finds expression in dance, right? So, so the past is so important, but not being held hostage to the past. You use the past as the, the springboard on which you build for the future. Talk a, talk a little bit about the, the performance um, and how many performances you do and, and what uh, shape those take, and then your other programs as well. Yes, so the, when it comes to the performing parts of the organization, um, our um, mission statement uh, tells us clearly where we want to go. We need to preserve the tradition of classical ballet. We need to promote the appreciation of contemporary ballet, contemporary dance, and we need to create works of enduring quality. And so we have six programs every year. Ideally, three, three for bills, contemporary programs, and three full lengths. Sometimes it's four and two, depending on, on the year. And then at the same time, we, um, so we promote the appreciation of the classical form of uh, dance ballet. We, uh, we make sure that we present and we promote appreciation for contemporary works, the works that talk about who we are today. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we want to create new works because we should never forget that if Giselle, the classical work that we are preserving, if we are preserving it today is because somebody created really? it in 1841, somebody commissioned it. And so if we don't do the same thing today, 150 years from now, there is going to be nothing that talks about who we are socially today. And the vocabulary of classical ballet cannot be static. Otherwise, it dies. As soon as, as soon as there are no new ballets, 
it's the, the art itself starts to atrophy. Absolutely, absolutely. The 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 the, the death sentence sentence for dance and, and especially for ballet is if you stop creating new works. And you're absolutely right. Dance evolves, technique evolves, and so the what we call contemporary ballet, contemporary dance that started around the 1960s, really, with, with that group of choreographers, the Macmillans, the Krankos, well, it used what was created before, the technique of the 1840s to the 1890s, used that kind of technique and evolved it into, into a, something that is aesthetically closer to the taste of our time. Um, but we don't just perform. I mean, beside the six programs that we, we present for the audience every year, we have two schools, the SEM Group Center for Dance Education and the Hardesty Center for Dance Education. We serve about 650 students, local area students. Um, the premises being that uh, dance is what we do best. Um, we have uh, dancers and teachers from all over the world kids that come to our uh, building and experience dance in the studio, we teach them how to move around. Uh, we also um, do a different kind of educational program through performances. For example, last year I commissioned a brand new Peter and the Wolf. Dance is, uh, is kind of a difficult art form to connect with when you are very young because it lacks words and kids have a problem seeing something and not hearing words. And so Peter and the Wolf, the Prokofiev score, right. is narrated. And when you have a narrator, you alter a little bit the story so that the narrator becomes part of the story. And then suddenly dance has words. And I mean, this program is fantastic because it's breaking a lot of barriers. Kids think, oh my gosh, ballet is tough. Oh my gosh, ballet, I'm not going to understand it. And they go there and suddenly they can hear the words and see the actions and they connect to dance and hopefully we make them believers for the rest of their lives. Well, that's, that's actually a gift. If you look at some of the great uh, educators across the classic arts, as we lose the, the connection to, that our grandparents have, that has to be replaced by explanation and enjoyment and experience. And what you're doing is you're creating the, the platform that these young people didn't grow up with, but now they can grow up with it through you, through these educational pro programs. And especially with ballet. With ballet, there are a lot of preconceived ideas, preconceived notions that we need to break. And so anything that has words helps us better connect as a first step, as a first interaction. And then hopefully we can bring those people back to see something that is, uh, that is without words, you know, more, more balletic. With a $7 million budget, 75 staff about? 75 staff, yeah. It's, that is a huge operation. And, and this is not the kind, if, if you were to take this operation and you were to move it to downtown New York, it would, the budget would be- 35 million. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, so, and that's the way it needs to be understood. It, it can't be understood in terms of the budget alone. It has to be understood in terms of the scale the international connection that it affords here in Tulsa, the quality of life change that it brings to, and the support that the citizens lend, it, it, is, it is really such a huge factor in this region and for the ballet world. And, and, and also for the fact that, uh, that I strongly believe um, people in Tulsa or anywhere else in, you know, in, uh, in smaller cities in this country have the same right to see the works of the greatest choreographers of the world uh, as the people in New York. And so if you take Tulsa Bala, you, uh, you, well, you live in San Francisco probably, well, we have the same kind of choreographers that work with San Francisco Bala. Uh, Wildon, McGregor, Killian, Forsyth, Duato, uh, Edward Young, everybody that works with the big companies, they also come to Tulsa. We have the same repertory, similar repertory, 90% of a San Francisco ballet in a city like Tulsa. And then we, we also act as a cultural ambassador. Actually, we are the cultural ambassador for uh, the state of Oklahoma. Uh, these companies performed in Serbia, Croatia, Italy, uh, Switzerland, Spain, uh, Seoul, South Korea, the Kennedy Center, the, the Joyce in New York. We are all over the world. We, uh, and that's actually 
for me one of the most exciting experiences because Tulsa, especially abroad, is a funny name. And so where, wherever we, we go, you know, we were in, in Spain, Switzerland, and Italy, Italy for the second time just a few months ago. And before the show, everybody sort of giggling about our name. And after the first piece that we perform, the atmosphere in the theater is totally different. Everybody's on their smartphones, not checking out Tulsa Ballet, but checking out the city of Tulsa. How is this city that can host this type of ballet company? And also the reviews. I mean, can you believe that this company is called every time in the last four years that we toured one of the top 10 American ballet companies, one of the top five American ballet companies, one of the five most relevant ballet companies in the United States of America. And what is so important about this point, the point behind the point, is that the audiences that you describe are unrelenting critics, right? I mean, they know the art and they are not going to be generous if the art is not up to that level. Yeah, because you're talking about audiences in Verona, in Seville, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Lugano, uh, audiences that are used to see all the big ballet companies. And you're talking about critics that will see us once and will never see us again. So they have no interest in sugarcoating the pill. It is what it is. Uh, and also the, the, the experience, I mean, the, the first time we performed in Italy, uh, I'll never forget it. In uh, Trieste, we, that was in 2016, we finished the performance and you know everybody's clapping and then the lights go up and I'm talking to some people in the audience and the audience would not stop. They would not stop clapping. I had to run backstage uh, and call the dancers back on stage. They were half undressed. I said, guys, they're they not leaving. They don't want to leave. You need to come back on stage. And by the time I wrangled them on stage, the curtain operator was smoking a cigarette at the stage door. So I, <laughs> and I went, picked him up, went up on stage again. They were still clapping. That is, it's a wonderful story. Marcello Angelini, this is such a wonderful company. You have, with the community, created something quite extraordinary. Thank you so much for your leadership of Tulsa Ballet, sharing the stories of the company, and thank you so much for your insights. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you.